How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome to my 2023 prediction and analysis video of the 2023 NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. In this video, we will be breaking down each of the eight series in the first round here in the 2023 postseason, as well as predicting to the best of our abilities, the second, third rounds and then the Stanley Cup final. Last season, I was pretty good. I think I was right. I think I was 100% uh, right in the Eastern Conference, if I'm not mistaken. In the Western Conference, I had Calgary coming out over uh, Colorado and then Calgary winning the cup. Unfortunately, Calgary fell in the Western Conference Final, but we'll see how I do this year. I will be filling out the bracket for the NHL's Bracket Challenge, and we will be doing a Bracket Challenge here on the channel, so if you want details on that, be sure to stick around until the end of the video. I'm very excited for this postseason. I'm sure you are as well. Many very tight matchups, a lot of races for postseason seeding that came down to the final few games of the season. So in this episode, we'll be breaking down all the series, looking at the season that was, which team could do what against which team, especially breaking breaking down how teams have been since the deadline, since the halfway point, who is on the upswing, who's on the downswing, and not just the nuts and bolts of, okay, which team was seated higher. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this party started. In round number one, we have the Avalanche and the Kraken over in the Western Conference. They are the winners of their division versus the first wild card, Seattle, uh, Colorado versus Seattle, that is. The Avalanche will be coming in as defending Stanley Cup champions, but without their captain, Gabe Landeskog. In the season that was, the Avalanche had four more points team-wise. So goal scoring, the Kraken actually scored more goals per game by about 0.2 and, and change. Goals against per game by, what, 0.3, about 0.4 and change, less by the Avalanche. A much stronger power play percentage, a much stronger penalty kill percentage, and of course, they have a lot more firepower. Despite the Kraken having scored more, I think the big names are in Colorado's favor. So jumping over to the stats right now, as we'll be switching between a few pages Nathan McKinnon with his 111 point season Miko Rantanen scoring 55 goals Kale McCarr 66 points in 60 games a lot of other under the radar performances like JT Comfer scoring 52 points Lekkanen 51 in 64 someone who really surprised me as well was Bowen Byram who has 24 points since coming back in the 42 games that he has played so the Avalanche are an extremely strong team where things are a bit shaky for the Avalanche just in general will be their goaltending absolutely no, no, all credit to Alex Gorgiev, 40 wins, 919 save percentage, 2.53 goals against average. Those aren't horrible numbers, but when I look at the other top goalies in the league, Allmark, Ottinger, Shosturkin, Hellebuck, Vasilevsky, Ilya Sorokin as well. There are many goalies who I would rather have than Georgiev. All credit to him pulling a Darcy Kemper from last season. I don't think goaltending will be the Avalanche's downfall. I just think it's one of their weaker points. Meanwhile, for the Seattle Kraken, they had an incredible season as well, headlined by Jared McCann, a player that I've had in a couple of fantasy seasons in a row. I'm a big fan of Jared McCann, very underrated player who's finally getting his due, I think, in my opinion. He scored, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, 40 goals, 70 points in 79 games. Great season from him. Vince Dunn, a, a a dark horse for some Norris votes absolutely this season. 64 points in 81 games from Vince Dunn. The rookie season, definitely, I would think, the caller going to Matty Beneers, 57 and 80 from him. The scoring does drop off quite a bit, but in general, the Kraken do have more spread out goal scoring than the Avalanche. One, two, three, four, five, six players who scored 20 goals or more more as opposed to the Avalanche who we just saw before yes they have uh, Miko Renton and his 55 goals but when it comes to offense they're really relying on him and McKinnon because aside from them they only have Lekkanen with 21 goals and no one else in that 20 plus category so all that being said the Avalanche are an extremely strong team if we look at them as just a team record as well since the halfway point this is the season that was they finished the sixth best in the NHL yes but I think that they are much stronger than the numbers would say because if we look by game this is something that'll be doing a lot in this video looking at it by game if we were to sort by the halfway point i believe the, ex the exact halfway point is january 11th if i can go ahead and skim till there come on thank you very much internet let's do it 
the Avalanche, since the halfway point in the season, are the second best team in the league, 31, 8, and 4. In terms of winning percentage, they are third best, as the Oilers are the highest, as something else that we'll uh, touch upon later. Since the trade deadline, the deadline was March 3rd, let's say since March 4th, since uh, changes really come in a day later, people get on the planes and fly over. The Avalanche are the best team in the league record-wise, going 17, 4, and 2 since the deadline. And in terms of win percentage, they are in third behind the Oilers and the Bruins. So the Avalanche, despite being sixth in the league since the halfway point, since the deadline, top two, top three team, I would love for the Kraken to go on a magical run or something, but I do think that it will be the Avalanche who win this series rather comfortably. Uh, I don't want to say sweep. I will be touching upon which series I think could be a sweep, but I think the Avalanche will take it in five. I'm going to fill out the games later on, but I'm going to give it to Colorado in five. Maybe some from some Jared McCann magic putting the Kraken through in one game while Gorgiev struggles perhaps. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the Avalanche take it in five in round number one. They've been a very strong team and we'll see what happens with them. Now on to the next series. We have Dallas versus Minnesota. Very even matchup here as the Wild had more points but the Stars were seated higher. The Stars are more of an offensive team and the defense is quite close as well although the Wild do have it in that category as well. Special teams also also going to the Stars, and the Stars also have one of the best players in the league, one of the NHL's 100-point scorers this past season in Jason Robertson, who scored 109 points. After that, yes, it does drop off in terms of the, the, the chasm between one and two, but Jamie Benn, Joe Pavelski, Rupe Hintz, and Miro Heiskanen, four 70-plus point players, you can't play around with that. Tyler Sagan wasn't great this year, still 21 goals, 50 points, but they have found offense from other sources. Rupe Hintz has established himself as one of the most underrated players in the league. I think the narrative of guys like, oh, Alex Barkov is so underrated, I think that's done. I think Barkov's getting his respect. I think the next guy to slot into that most underrated player in the league has to be Rupe Hintz. The guy scores 37 goals, 75 points, over point per game, and I feel like not really anybody's talking about him. Jamie Benn turned back the clock, Pavelski turned back the clock. The, the Dallas Stars are a very strong team. Meanwhile, the Minnesota Wild, I think that they are, I think it's fair to say that they are very reliant on Kirill Kaprizov. And we saw that when he was out of the lineup. Yes, they had Matthew Boldy carrying, but if Boldy wasn't doing what he was doing when Kaprizov was injured, that would have been a very different story. Dallas, since the deadline, is also fifth in terms of best record since the deadline. So the Wild have an uphill battle. Yes, Kaprizov's a 40-goal scorer with 75 points. Yes, Matt Boldy hit 31 goals. Incredible stuff. But Joel Eriksson, he's injured right now. Uh, Marcus Johansson should be back. He's been very, very good. 18 points in 20 games. So I think that the Wild are going to make this a good series. But I can't say I'm necessarily sold on them, especially when after your top four scorers, you drop to 30-some point guys. Yes, Ryan Hartman, uh, if you look at points per game points per game played you have Hartman who would be ranked more highly as he only played in now this throws things off with games played but Nyquist five points in three games Johansson 18 and 20 if he comes back if we can get Hartman uh, extrapolated over the postseason John Klingberg since the deadline nine points in 17 games so all that to say I'm trying to find a way to be polite about this I know there's a lot of wild fans on this channel but I do think that the stars are going to take it and another reason why is the goaltending while Gustafson and Flurry have both been good I think it's a bit of a still a battle for the crease, right? Um, if you see Mark Andre Fleury, he went 24, 16, and 4 on the year, close to three goals against, just above 900 save percentage. Gustafson's numbers were way better. You would think Fleury is the guy with the experience, but you got to go by the numbers. Gustafson, if he's the starter and he's playing at 931 save percentage and 2.1 goals against average, that is probably the Wild's best hope of making it out of this, the first round. However, they may be running into Jake Ottinger, who's also coming off of a historic show last season in the seven game series against Calgary where he stopped what like 13 or 14 goals above expected 919 save percentage 2.37 goals against average for him on the year definitely in my opinion a Vezina finalist if not a Vezina top five so it's going to be tough for Minnesota not only to make it through the scoring but also find a way to get through Jake Ottinger who had an incredible season and I think will continue to do so so all that to say I do believe that the stars will take it I'll get into the games later on but just to give you my thoughts now I think it's going to be a six or seven game series but I think I do lean 
beating Dallas in six games, and it'll be the Avalanche versus the Stars in round number two. Now, on to the next couple of series here in the Western Conference. We have Vegas, Winnipeg, and Edmonton, LA. Vegas and Winnipeg. Now, in this series, you have the Vegas Golden Knights, who I think kind of quietly have gone under the radar as one of the best teams in the league, especially since the deadline and since the halfway point or so, as they finished with 99 points, 3.267 goals for per game. They lead the Jets in that regard. They are just a, a hair less in uh, goals against per game. The, the Jets with Connor Hellebuck just get a like point, point. what 0. 0.25, 0. 0.03 out of some slight advantage in goals against over the Golden Knights. Special teams, power play goes to, goes to Vegas, but a much stronger penalty kill to the Jets. Lots of quiet things in Winnipeg. A lot of quiet things in this whole series. The Vegas Golden Knights, going back to the teams here, since the trade deadline have been the fourth best team in the league in terms of record. 14, 3, and 3 since the trade deadline since the halfway point also still in that conversation even better i believe since the halfway point since january 11th they are top six as well yeah not as high in terms of positioning sixth best since the halfway point fourth best since the deadline 24 9 and 7 since the halfway point but they've been consistently one of the top teams and that's why they finished where they did the vegas golden knights won the western conference they had a 51 22 and 9 season 111 points very close to being second uh, first runner-up to the Bruins of course by a wide margin but the Hurricanes and Devils are just slightly ahead of them so Vegas had a great season headlined by some strong scoring especially without their captain Mark Stone out for so long he only played well, well he played about half the season 43 games if he comes back that would be a huge help they didn't quite have anyone go crazy yes Jack Eichel was around point per game but it was a scoring by committee kind of team that's what Vegas has been Chandler Stevenson Marcia so Smith Smith, Carlson. It's been a few years now that these guys are coming together to put, to, you know, cobble together a very strong season. Put, you know, stack on top of that some some quiet players like Michael Amadio with 16 goals and 27 points. You have Phil the Thrill Kessel who's still out there, the Iron Man. Shea Theodore, one of the best defensemen in the NHL, helps as well when he's with uh, Alex Petrangelo on that blue line. Guys like Paul Cotter with 13 goals. Barbashev a big deadline pickup, 16 points in 23 games for him. Vegas is a well constructed team. Even even if they're not led by any huge, crazy star power, they are a strong team. Now, Vegas' goaltending, that's where things have been a little shaky, as they've had, what, four different goalies play this season? If we just look at Vegas' goaltenders, I believe the starter will be uh, Laurent Brassois for the Vegas Golden Knights. I'm not sure why they're only showing us these two, but we have Logan Thompson, Aiden Hill, Laurent Brassois, Jonathan Quick. Um, not sure why they're not showing me. Games played... Has to be greater than 25. Is that maybe why that was going in there? There we go. So Thompson, Hill, Brassois, Quick, and even Patera. All five different goaltenders playing for Vegas this season. You, uh, the, de the duo going into the postseason will be Brassois and Quick. Uh, yes, Brassois has been very good at a 927 save percentage and 2.17 goals against average. But when they face, maybe not the better offense, but the better top half of the lineup. I mean, you know, Vegas all around as a team, their offense has been better. But when you have Kyle Connor, Mark Scheifele in his 42 goals, you have uh, Pierre Dubois in his 63 points in 73 games, Ehlers 38 and 45, I think the, the, the Jets maybe have the bigger performances. While the Golden Knights perhaps have had the better ability of coming together and getting it done as a unit. I mean, I don't like teams, you know, it's always fun to have stars, but I don't like teams that always rely on one or two guys because if they, if they go down and no one's there to replace them, it's going to be ugly. Take away Kaprizov from Minnesota, you have Matt Boldy. Take him away, who's scoring your goals? Again, not a dig at the Minnesota Wild, just a situation that we saw over the last few weeks in the real world NHL. Josh Morrissey, I think he's definitely a, a Norris Trophy finalist. He had a 76-point season. So all this to say, it on paper looks like a, you know, two strong teams going at it. But when you look a bit deeper, we looked at the stats from Vegas. When you look at it a bit more closely, looking at since the halfway point of all the postseason teams, the Winnipeg Jets are the worst. Just a hair above 500, a 512 record, going 20, 19, and 2 since the halfway point in their last 41 games. This is not a team that convinces me. This is a team that kind of got in by fraudulence from Calgary, for lack of a better term. Term. The Predators almost pushed them out, honestly, of the Predators who had a much better record. Well, 
much better. They had uh, three more wins, which could have been the end of them since the halfway point. So the Jets are not a team that convinces me. And honestly, I think Vegas, for all that they have, their ability to come together, they're at their strongest. They may get Mark Stone back. I think Vegas is going to sweep Winnipeg out of the first round. I think they'll put up a fight. I don't think it's going to be an easy sweep. I think Hellebuck can definitely pull off some miracles, especially when you look at his numbers. If we just clear these filters and go back to the entire league, you see Hellebuck with his 920 save percentage, 2.49 goals against average. I think he could make it interesting. Maybe he steals a game. It's possible, but I do lean sweep for the Vegas Golden Knights. Now onto the Oilers and the Kings. This is a rematch from last year. The Kings were up three games to two through five games. The Oilers came back winning games six and seven to go through to the second round and would ultimately get swept out of the Western Conference final by Colorado. So it's another interesting matchup with some bad blood. The Edmonton Oilers, of course, the more offensive team as they have Connor McDavid in there, almost four goals per game. Meanwhile, the Kings are allowing 3.16 per game. So that could be a dangerous matchup here. The Oilers allow 3.289, technically more, but the Kings score less. Power play percentage in Edmonton's favor, despite a very good power play from the LA Kings and penalty kill is relatively even the slight edge going to the Oilers looking at these stats now I think it's fair to say that any team with Connor McDavid would be the favorite especially in a first round matchup 64 goals 153 points from McDavid dry saddle 128 of his own with 52 goals Ryan Nugent Hopkins is always out there with 104 he had 53 power play points as well this season ridiculous stuff Zach Hyman was over point per game with a career high in goals of 36 after that it does drop off drop off quite a bit Darnell nurse Tyson Barry who's no longer there you kind of take him out of the equation as well Evan Bouchard has been really good especially in the last like 20 games I think he's been point per game over the last 15 20 games uh Evander Kane has not been everything that Edmonton had hoped that they had seen a bit of last season negative four but still 16 goals that would be on pace for a 32 goal season and uh, just shy of 60 points so that wouldn't be horrible but when you see Zach Hyman putting up 83 you'd maybe want a little bit more from Kane a little bit more from Yamamoto you also have the trade deadline pickup of Matthias Janmark. He has been instrumental. Four goals, 10 assists, 20, uh, plus 28 through 21 games. He has been a great revelation, exactly what the Oilers needed. Uh, I was skeptical of moving out Tyson Barry, but the results speak for themselves. Barry is great. He was a big piece of the, of the Predators almost making it. But I think the Oilers are an incredibly well-constructed team. They're also the third best team since the halfway point and since the deadline in terms of record, but they are the best team in terms of uh, win percentage since the deadline and since the halfway point. I'm not going to pull up both of those. Just looking at the halfway point, though, 800 win percentage, better by 0 .002 than the Bruins, going 29-5-6 and six through 40 games since the halfway point. That is, yeah, the Bruins played two more games, but even if we put them on an even playing field and said, let's say since the trade deadline, I said I wasn't going to do it, but I suppose now I will, more of an even even playing field here the Bruins again they played two more games but now it's a bigger divide the Oilers 868 win percentage 16 2 and 1 since the deadline incredible stuff they're getting 34 shots per game since the deadline as well they're putting the puck on net McDavid's on another level now I don't say all this to say and that's why the Kings are losing the Kings are having a great season as well they have a great mix of veterans and young players that have been getting the job done Kopitar still leading in his older age Kevin Fiala 72 points point per game plus Kempe was an incredible revelation scoring 41 goals again one of the most one of the more quiet 40 goal seasons not getting the respect he deserves quite yet Victor Arvidsson had a nice bounce back campaign one point shy of 60 Philippe Dano one of my personal favorites great year Dowdy was a plus 12 52 points Gabe Velarde taking on more responsibility 23 goals we see this in a lot of players Arthur Kaliev he scored 28 and 56 Quinton Byfield 22 and 53 this is gonna be a great team down the road they're still trying to find themselves but I like the mix that they have again it may come down a little bit to goaltending another team that has had a little bit of mix in the in the crease as we see Phoenix Copley, you know, nothing quick, you know, it's Salo and Cal Peterson all playing this season. Phoenix Copley at one point was otherworldly, came back down to earth a little bit, but his record is still nuts. 24, 6, and 3 on the season, 903 save percentage, 2.64 goals against. Salo, technically the better numbers, but 7, 3, and 1 since they picked him up at the deadline. I would think Salo is the guy that they are riding with at the moment, but it's good to have Phoenix Copley backed, uh, backing him up just in case. Does it matter? 
there against Connor McDavid on the pace that he has been on? Hard to say. So when I have the when I say that I think the Edmonton Oilers are going to go through, I think it's just because they are an incredibly well built team. They are not just Connor McDavid this season. I think they have a lot of potential to go very far. We'll look a bit more closely in round number two. So I think that the Avalanche will take it in five, the Vegas Golden Knights in four, Dallas in six, and when it comes to the Oilers and the Kings, I'm I feel reluctant to put this down, but I'm going to say five games. And this is not a slight against the Kings at all. This just speaks to the power of the Oilers and their record since the halfway point, since the deadline, and what they've been doing and how they've built their team. So I'm going to submit those games for the Western Conference. And now we move over to the Eastern Conference. Starting off by looking at the Bruins and the Panthers in round number one. The Bruins, you got to speak about what they did this season. 65 wins, NHL record, 3.66 goals for per game. Game, 2.09 goals against per game. That's where the Panthers may be done in here. The Bruins may be scoring around the same pace as Florida will be, but they allow a goal and a half, almost a goal and a half, more like a goal and a third less per game. Power play goes to the Panthers. Penalty kill by far goes to the Bruins. They have a 60 goal scorer in David Pasternak. Carter Verhage, another guy who's had an incredibly quiet and very, I don't know if the word is disrespected, but just like not uh, not super publicized season. He has been incredible. So going back to the stats here, looking at the Boston Bruins, not much to say about Boston. We all know how good they are. David Pasternak and his 61 goals and 113 points. Marshawn, 67 and 73. Does it scare me that it drops off a little bit after Pasternak? Not really, honestly. They have such strong defense. They can afford this type of not being so top heavy, uh, this not so top heavy play style. Patrice Bergeron still in his older age again I would say this is the favorite for the um, the Selkie trophy 27 goals 58 points points from him Pavel Zaka was a great surprise for the Bruins they picked him up a lot of people were wondering about that trade many people of course remember didn't even have the Bruins making the playoffs with their injuries at the start of the season ended up being almost nothing Mar Bergeron misses four games Marshawn misses nine games Krejci misses 12 games on the year Taylor Hall ended up missing what 21 games not a huge deal for anybody so Zaka 57 points, Krejci 56 coming back from Europe, Lindholm had an incredible year, plus 49, 53 points from him, Charlie McAvoy also 52 and a plus 29, he has been on a great streak as Boston's guy, and it's not too, it doesn't hurt to have Lindholm there with you either. Jake DeBrusque 50 and 64, a lot of people not seeing what he's doing, I think because of how stacked the top six is, he's more than that, you know, he's in the middle six. Charlie Coyle 45, Taylor Hall 36 and 61, not what he used to be. I wouldn't say he factors in as much as he used to, but he's still out there. Frederick, Grizzlick, depth pieces like Felino, Felino, uh, Thomas Nosek. You have Dmitry Orlov, who was a deadline pickup. 17 points and a plus 10 in 23 games. He was one of my favorite deadline moves of the entire uh, trade deadline season. Orlov getting picked up was a great decision. And same for Tyler Bertuzzi, who has 16 points in 21 games. So the Bruins were super strong, and I think they just got stronger, and I don't see them getting stopped by the Florida Panthers. Before I even talk about Florida, I'm sorry. I just don't see it. They have the best record since the halfway point, the second best record since the deadline. Winning percentage, I believe, second in both of those categories. And just, again, record-breaking stuff this year through six, with 65 wins. Now, Florida will definitely put up a fight. They are a strong offensive team, but I really do question their defense. Matthew Kachuk scored 40 goals and 109 points. Barkov was great. Brendan Montour was another underrated guy this season. Carter Verhage quietly scoring 42 goals. Sam Reinhart was good. Loster Reinen was very good as well. Forsling, Sam Bennett, a great pickup from the Flames, a, what, a couple years back now? Ekblad, not really what people were hoping from him. Negative 14, 38 points. He had a difficult year. Lundell, Stahl turns back the clock. He's still very useful in his role. And then a lot of depth pieces after that. A guy like Nick Cousins, who I like a lot. Guys like Colin White. Guys like, who's another forward out here? Giovanni Smith, four points in 34 games. There he is. So I think that they are a top six type of team. What I mean by that is they're not getting depth scoring. I And that's not necessarily uh, the, 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 the game breaker. That doesn't. That's not the deal breaker, excuse me. 
The you know, Matthew Kachuk, incredible pickup. He has been so good, and the defense is scoring a ton, but I do question the goaltending. I didn't look at Allmark's numbers, by the way, but just shout out to him. Remember, 938 save percentage and 1.89 goals against average. Could he win the Vesna with only playing 49 games played? I think absolutely. It would be one of the more uncommon things to happen, but I think his numbers are just that good that it demands it. Now, that being said, moving over to the Florida Panthers, I can't exactly say who their starter is going to be because Spencer Knight is out of the equation. Alex Lyon has been 14, 9, and 4 with a 914 save percentage and 2.89 goals against. Not too shabby. Bobrovsky is their guy, but he's been injured. He was sick for a bit, yeah, and his last three starts, I'm looking at his numbers now, were 5 2, 4 3, and 6 2 losses against the Senators, Rangers, and Maple Leafs, respectively. So if I had to put money on it, I would think think Alex Lyon is going to be the starter for like game one, game two, but I'm sure that Bobrovsky will be seeing some of the nets with his 10 plus million dollar price tag. So the goaltending, the defense, bit too shaky for my liking, despite the offense being there. I think the Bruins take it. I think they take it comfortably. I could see one game going to Florida. Maybe I'll say five. Uh, I pff, maybe just Matthew Kachuk and the and the offense breaks through Allmark one night, but in general the defense is too good on the Bruins, and I think that they will take it rather comfortably through five games. Not a tighter five game series like I had mentioned for the Oilers and Kings, a more Boston dominant five game series. Now we move on to the Maple Leafs and the Lightning. This one's an interesting one, absolutely. The Maple Leafs have not made it to the second round since 2004, almost two decades ago they've lost in the first round of the qualifying round what like the last seven years in a row they are scoring almost exactly the same pace as the lightning their goals against per game is better by about a third of a goal power play almost identical penalty kill almost identical this is an amazing matchup that we've known was coming for a very long time now now when we're looking at the teams look at the teams first the records do scare me a little bit since the nhl's trade deadline of all the postseason teams to have their record on the screen right now the tampa bay lightning have the worst record 23rd in the league since the deadline Line. after they gave up so much to get you know Tanner Janot and everybody 9 11 and 1 with a 452 win percentage in those 21 games since the deadline that is a very scary number to me that's a very real and scary number to me I think that the Lightning have you know they're they have the ability to turn it on they have so much postseason experience I wouldn't say my decision for what I'm going to say later is going to be based off of just the deadline records but it definitely is a real and scary number sub 500 and it's not like by 0.02 percent since the deadline Kucherov another great season 30 goals 113 points love to see it brain point another 50 goals well another just in the terms of the NHL 51 goals there 95 points Stamkos also point per game plus Brendan Hagel he was a great decision to bring in from the Hawks last trade deadline he scores 64 points on his contract 64 from Sergachev 64 from Alex Kalorn a lot of guys who are flying under the radar as well and such a stacked team guys like Ross Colton Colton Nick Paul Anthony Sorelli all doing what they have always done Corey Perry not quite in the same role that he's been in previous years negative 28 is ugly and then the rest of the team you see, it's, it's a lot of the same pieces that the Lightning have had in the past few years. Tanner Janot, one goal, four points, 22 penalty minutes in 20 games since he came over. I know his ice time, I can't see it. Oh, there it is, 11.55 per night. It's nothing incredible, but it's enough to say you would think, you know, you would hope for a bit more. Um, that's about it for the Lightning that I would want to look at. A very strong offensive team, as we saw in the numbers, but it just hasn't quite been coming together. Meanwhile, the Maple Leafs, they've been a strong team, not top five or top six since the deadline or anything like that, but they've been doing what they can with their difficulties between the pipes. 99 points on the year for Mitch Marner, Nylander 87 with 40 goals, Matthews 85 with 40 goals, Tavares 80 with 36 goals. So a lot of goal scoring here. Drops off after that, but Bunting still almost a, four, a 50 point season. In. Morgan Riley 41 in 65. Cali Yarncrow 20 goals on the year from him. Um, after that, no one really entices me that much. I'm a big fan of Engvall and Sandin, and those are two guys that they traded away. I wasn't a huge fan of their deadline moves. I like that they picked up McCabe, Lafferty, but I didn't like trading away Sandin and Engvall. I know they got good value and all that, but 
I think as a team, it wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't the move that strengthened them the most. lilligren has been taking on a new role this season. He's playing almost 18 minutes of ice time per night. Brody playing over 21 per night. He's a big piece. Of course, Ryan O'Reilly, 11 points in 13 games. He's back and fully healthy. So I think that the, the, the Maple Leafs, did what they did while guys like Ryan O'Reilly were injured, goaltenders were in and out. Now if they can get fully healthy, well, they are fully healthy. I know Samsonov was um, was uh, questionable at the end of the season, but now give them a fully healthy team against the Lightning, who have also been healthy, but have had that shaky record. I think, I, I you know, dare I say it? I think this could be the year where the Maple Leafs make it through. I love the meme. I'm a Canadiens fan. Of course, I love it. But I'm also a hockey fan. And I got to be objective. Plus, I got you know, to love the storylines. You got to root for the for the underdogs. They're not quite the underdogs in terms of their record. So, I, you know, part of me also wants Tampa to win because it would be cool to see how their dominance continues, how they turn it on in the postseason, and how they are just not going to stop and they're going to get the most out of this uh, team that they can before their window closes. That would be fun as well. Vasilevsky had a great year not a dominant year 915 save percentage 2.65 goals against meanwhile samsonov was the majority had the majority of the starts he went 27 10 and 5 919 save percentage better than vasilevsky 2.33 goals against better than vasilevsky four shutouts same as vasilevsky so in the goaltending battle i'm not going to say samsonov's better than vasilevsky but in terms of what he did this season samsonov was better now does vasilevsky turn into playoff mode and allow one goal per game and just go lights out it may very well happen so all this to say i'm gonna go leafs it's crazy but i'm gonna go leafs in round number one i would you know i'm happy either way but i would also i would be probably be a bit happier if the lightning win just continue the meme uh, but i think that the leafs will finally get out of round number one and it's not gonna be easy as they'll <laughs> exit round number one to face the bruins in round number two and I do think that it'll come down to a seven-game series. So, of course, in Game 7, anything can happen. But I do see the Leafs going through in seven. Now through to the Hurricanes and the Islanders. On paper, the Hurricanes easily dominate the Islanders. I think just the numbers speak for themselves. But I do think this will be a tight series. And I'll tell you why. It's now, first off, the Hurricanes scoring more goals than the Islanders and allowing less than the Islanders as well. Better, better special teams, power play, pound and kill. They're better in just about every way, honestly. Looking at their goaltending, though, if I look at the Carolina Hurricanes, it's been a bit of a shaky year for the goaltending. They, well, Freddie Anderson's been good when he has played. He's only started 33 games, though, as Ranta and Kachekov has all have also played. Collectively, they have a, a save percentage above 900 and a goals against average that is probably like 2.3 something, 2.4 something. So that, and you know, and they strung together nine shutouts. So absolutely strong goaltending, but just like question marks. You know what I'm saying? Question marks. So, Freddie Anderson, 21-11-1. If he's the starter, I do have confidence in him. On paper, he had the worst numbers of all three goaltenders, but I do think that he can be trusted, and if he has to leave for any reason, I am a huge anti ranta fan. He went 19-3-3 this year, 9-10 save percentage, 2.23 goals against. So while the reality of, you know, who's between the pipes has been shaky, I didn't mean to make it seem as though the Hurricanes goaltending itself has been shaky, just who's it going to be, that's always a question mark. I think the goaltending itself has been absolutely serviceable i wouldn't say it's been elite but i'd say it's been very good but if there's going to be any wild card factor in this series it is going to be Ilya sorokin who went 31 22 and 7 on the year nothing to write home about but a 924 save percentage and 2.34 goals against average with six shutouts despite those numbers leading the league in shutouts as well incredible stuff from sorokin doing what he can with the team in front of him looking at the teams now the the Islanders haven't done anything special since the half since the deadline. They're 11, six and one, which is 19th best. It is a 639 winning percentage which would actually be 13th best. But the Hurricanes, since the halfway point, have been the fifth best team record-wise. Since the deadline, not so much. This is since, yeah, since the deadline, correct. Since the deadline, not so much. At a 568, they're 12, 9, and 1. So the Islanders, despite having the better winning percentage since the deadline, I still think the Hurricanes will take it, but I do think that uh, Ilya Sorokin will make it interesting. Plus, if we go and look at the Islanders' scorers, 
we will see, yes, Bo Horvat, big pickup, but Matthew Barzell, also someone who's likely going to be coming back from injury. He had 51 points in 58 games. That's a huge, huge addition. Brock Nelson quietly with 75 points on the year. Anders Lee with 50 points, 28 goals. Where is big Bo top 50? Horvat, there he is, 16 points in 30 games. He's not a guy who's there for offense, of course, we know that. He scored all his goals with Vancouver, yes, but that's not necessarily his his the hallmark of his game. He's still scoring a point every other game 16 and 30 and he's eating those big minutes 20 and a half minutes per night so add him into the mix add barzal excuse me into the mix with all of those guys i still don't think the offense is quite there they have one of the strongest defensive cores in the league with pollock and mayfield and uh, and pellick so that is where they're going to come out strong defense strong goaltending if they can get the offense going now that may be a huge scare for the hurricanes the hurricanes are you know they have enough offense of their own they do have sveshnikov out for the postseason which is a huge huge blow he had 55 points in 64 games but you still have martin natchez who led the way surprisingly it was martin natchez who led the team in points not points per game but i don't think you know, i think if you ask the average fan who led the team in points you would they would say sebastian aho now is martin natchez so 71 points for him on the year aho 36 goals uh brent burns crazy stuff from him yesperi kakanyemi really good record not well the whole season 43 points on the year respectable through a full 82 games if we just look by game i believe let's just say since the deadline i think kakanyemi has had really good numbers i'm for blanking on what they are let me just grab a, a quick reminder here there you go 18 points in 22 games leading the hurricanes in that time and he's doing so in just over 15 and a half minutes of ice time per night now again do I love to laugh at the memes and that I'm a Canadians fan, Kakanyemi, ha ha ha. Sure. So I still, you know, as a Canadians fan, I do think that Kakanyemi is a bit overpaid. You know, I'm just going to say that. But I do think that he has been incredible since the deadline. Plus, his two way game has been coming along extremely well. So Kakanyemi is someone to keep note of as well. I'm a big fan of him um, in certain ways and not so much in others. So it's a tough life to live as a Canadians fan. Seth Jarvis, Brady Shea, Tara, Tara Vinen has been one of the biggest disappointments, honestly. 37 points in 68 games from him so all that to say still strong defense though it's not like the islanders that could have a little spark of offense and they're through no you still got burns shea uh pesci slavin one of the best top fours if not the best i would say the best top four in the entire nhl two of the best top fours in the league going at it between the islanders and the hurricanes the goaltending edge goes to the islanders the defense is pretty even and the scoring edge goes to the hurricanes so i I would I gotta say here I have the Hurricanes going through in seven but honestly I have to say I think this could be the making of a crazy upset if the stars align you know a lot of things could go wrong for the Islanders and the Hurricanes just easy five six games and they're through and it's not you know not nobody's sweating but if a certain you know a certain few things happen I could see it going to seven and, you know, things could go either way at that point. So I have the Hurricanes going through in seven and now we come down to the Battle of, what is it, Battle of the Hudson? Is that what it's called? The Devils and the Rangers, two incredible teams. The Devils have the fourth best record in the league since the halfway point while the Rangers have the sixth best record since the deadline. So it's going to, I think this, I've said there's some tight matchups up there, matchups out there. I think three of the four in the Eastern Conference are going to be extremely tight. The the uh, Maple Leafs, the Hurricanes, and now this one between the Devils and the Rangers. So I do see it going to seven. I won't give you which way I'm leaning just yet. The Devils scored more. The Rangers uh, allowed less. Power play slightly by about a percent and a half go to the Rangers. And Pony Kill by about a, percent and three quarters going to the devils great performances on both ha both sides as well if we go ahead and look at by yeah date range of the entire season very good let's start off with the devils since they are ranked more highly as i said the fourth best team record wise record wise since the halfway point this season jack hughes what an incredible year from him 99 points a 43 goal season from the young centerman 78 games played for him nico hisher with 80 points of his own the captain the former first overall pick getting lost in there i think as well 
30 goals, 80 points from him. Very good point per game season. Dougie Hamilton, another guy that got lost in the mix. 74 points this season from Dougie Hamilton. Incredible, incredible stuff from those top three point scores. And even Jesper Bratt with 32 goals and 73 points. The Devils had a strong offensive year, something that they were lacking in the past. Now, Dawson Mercer, 56 points. Great stuff. Thomas Tatar, 20 goals, 48 points. You love to see that. After that, we do start to drop off. I don't think the Devils quite have the depth scoring. I wouldn't put a lot of trust in Shrangovich or Miles Wood or Michael McLeod, uh, you know, Andre Palat, even unfortunately, if the going got tough. I do think that these top guys will continue to produce. But again, as I've always been saying throughout this video, throughout my entire life, you can't just have the top heavy team and nothing else. Thankfully, the Devils do have something else in their goaltending. And also forgot to mention, of course, their huge deadline pickup, Timo Meyer, nine goals, 14 points in 21 games. I think that he's going to stay long term in New Jersey. I think he is a great fit for that team. And I think that he could play a very big role very, very big role, especially when the Rangers went out and made their moves. Timo Meyer, that move had to happen. So that being said, I was just mentioning the goaltending. I think Vitek Vanacek needs a bit more respect on his name as well. Great season from him going 33-11-4, and 9-1-1 save percentage, 2.45 goals against. Now, if he goals, goes down, do I have trust in Mackenzie Blackwood? Unfortunately, I do not. At one point, he was supposed to be the heir to Martin Brodeur, right? Brodeur's retirement and Blackwood coming to the organization was not too far apart. A lot of people said, okay, we're going to have a little bit of pain, but now Blackwood is our guy, and he he hasn't really been that guy. Akira Schmid has been good, 9-5-2. and two. Would they play him over Blackwood? I could see it. So if Banachek goes down and you bring in Schmid, is that a viable option? I don't know. So again, when you speak about all these hypotheticals, this could never happen and Vanacek just goes lights out. But it's always something to keep in the back of your mind when you're building a team and when you're analyzing all of this. So Vanacek, in a very good season from him. First season as a full, full starter, I believe, as he was kind of more splitting with uh, Washington last year with Samsonov. So that is the New Jersey Devils, a very strong team. Now, if I go over to the New York Rangers, I think in many ways they are just as strong as we saw in the goals for goals against, right? But earlier on. Artemi Panarin, 29 goals, 92 points. Zabanjad, 39 goals, 91 points. Uh, Adam Fox, quietly, aside from the points, analytics-wise, I would say he may be, if it wasn't for Eric Carlson, he may be the Norris favorite. I would think he's first runner-up. 72 points from him. Vinny Trocek, 64, and Chris Kreider, 36 goals, not 50, but still a 36-goal season. Heidel had a very good record since the deadline as well. If we say, even since the halfway point, let's say, since the halfway point, the Rangers have had some good score, good uh, scoring from uh, different sources, which is always something you want to have. Heidel had 23 points in 40 games, Kako 22 and 40, Lafreniere 21 and 40, Barkley Goodrow, that good depth piece, you got to have guys like Goodrow, guys like Jimmy VC in there, Tarasenko since coming over had 21 points in 31 games, and Patrick Kane who came at the deadline, 12 points in 19 games, have they been everything that the Rangers thought they would be, I don't think so, I think they've been very good, I think they're putting up solid points, but I think they thought that Kane was going to thrive a little bit more than he has been, I, I don't mean to step on 12 points in 19 games i just think that they thought it may have been a bit more tyler mott another depth pickup 10 points in 24 games i like the scoring here in new, in new york absolutely the goaltending very strong as well igor shesterkin he was tied for second or yeah tied for second in league wins with 37 he who had a 916 save percentage and 2.48 goals against average while going 37 13 and 8 three shutouts as well so again breaking it all down scoring i think is pretty even defense hamilton versus fox it's pretty even i may get I, but i do believe the edge goes to the rangers goaltending i think the edge also goes to the rangers but that's not all that i base my decision on i think that this will absolutely be a series that goes to seven games and I think of all the series, this is the one, of the eight first round series, this is the one that is truly a Game 7 coin toss. Watch me be wrong and it's a five game series for somebody, but I do believe that this will be a seven game series coin toss. We're talking game seven double overtime and a lucky bounce is what decides it. So as someone's trying to predict, I think that makes it that much harder for me. My brain leans Rangers, but my heart leans devils so take having said all of that i will say devils in seven but please do keep in mind what i just said game seven double overtime coin toss and i'm gonna lean with my heart more than my mind maybe that's not a good idea i think the rangers 
don't get me wrong, there's a lot of Rangers fans on this channel. I think the Rangers could win, and I think if they win, they could also beat the Hurricanes. But I'm going to say, just for the sake of choosing somebody, I'm going to choose the Devils at this time. Now, the Bruins, I have them going through in seven, and then the uh, in five, excuse me, and the other three series are all going to be in seven games. So, all that being said, we've already looked at all the numbers. I'm not going to pull them all back up. We can go through this a bit more quickly towards the rest of my predictions after we've analyzed the first few rounds. Of course, be sure to leave your thoughts on my analysis and leave me your analysis as as well when it comes now to the conference semifinals avalanche versus stars i think the goaltending goes to the stars jake ottinger i think the offense goes to the avalanche comes down to the defense got mira heiskin versus kale mccarr Devontae's bowen byram but you also have to remember that the avalanche as i mentioned before second best record since the halfway point best record since the deadline i think they are a hotter team and i think that it's going to be devastation unfortunately for the stars once again i know there's stars fans out here shout out i know you're listening landon i know you're out there but I think that the Avalanche take it they don't ask you for how many games anymore but I think that this would be a six or seven game series I could definitely see it going to seven over in the other Western Conference series Vegas versus Edmonton another really good matchup here as the Oilers score more the Golden Knights allow less way better special teams from the Oilers in terms of their power play the Golden Knights have the edge in the penalty kill Keep in mind, remember, the Oilers' best record since the deadline, excuse me, best winning percentage since the deadline, third best record since the halfway point, third best record since the deadline. I think despite how good of a team Vegas is, McDavid and the team that is that is built over in Edmonton is just going to be stronger. And again, I think it could be a seven-game series. I, you know, Vegas, they won the Western Conference. This, on paper, is an upset. But I think that Vegas will drop in round number two to the Oilers so that we have a rematch of last year's Western Conference final between the Avalanche and the Oilers. Now, over in the Eastern Conference, I think, honestly, <laughs> I think the, the Maple Leafs are going to be burnt after their seven-game series against the Lightning. I think that the Bruins are going to be fresh. I think they're much better. They're the, the best record in the league since the halfway point. They scored six, They won 65 games. They're more rested. They're the better team all around, in my opinion. They score more, allow way less. Maple Leafs have the power play Bruins have the better penalty kill I think the Bruins take this one and I think they do it rather comfortably I think it could be a six game series but I don't think those losses are anything crazy a couple of tough bounces in overtime and I think that it would I think anyone who doesn't have the Bruins going through to at least the conference final if not the cup final is just trying you know fingers crossed for a crazy upset I think it's hard not to say that the Bruins are going to at least get to the third round over in the other series in the Eastern Conference of uh, the uh, conference semifinals Hurricanes and Devils the Hurricanes after coming through through against the Islanders maybe a bit of a scare that they get uh, I don't want to call them fraudulent as a team that did so well record wise if we clear out the filters and just look at the season that was they were the second best team in the league uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, winning percentage excuse me in terms of points they were the second best team in the league in terms of points and winning percentage going 52 21 and 9 that cannot be disrespected however since the deadline of the 16 teams to be in the postseason they are ranked 12th of those 16 teams i have not been impressed with them i think they can definitely get through the islanders they have a winning record of 12 9 and 1 but i don't know that scares me a little bit a lot of teams have been better than them i think that when you when they're going to be coming up against a devil team that will yes be tired or a rangers team that will yes be tired no matter who goes through of the devils and the rangers i think that team will beat the hurricanes again this could be a crazy thing to say this is the team that finished second in the nhl but i think that the devils or the rangers but here the devils I think the Devils would make it through against the Hurricanes. Record-wise, the Devils are fourth best since the halfway point, while the Hurricanes are fifth best. And, you know, the Hurricanes, as I just said, 12th out of the 16 teams since the deadline record-wise. I think the Devils are going to capitalize on that. The lack of scoring from Shveshnikov, perhaps, could play a major role. And then here you have my Western and Eastern Conference Finals. The Avalanche winning the Central, the Oilers second in the Pacific. In the East, the Bruins, who won the Atlantic, and the Devils, who were second in the Metro. Now, of course, course now it's if this happens and if if that happens and if 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 that happens so it's tough to get everything perfect but i think it will be a rematch between the avalanche and the oilers the avalanche swept the oilers out of the conference final last season again the oilers score more than anybody but they do allow quite a bit I think that is where the Oilers may have their downfall. I forgot to look at the Oilers goaltending earlier because we were so enamored by their um, by their scoring. 
Goaltending wise, Stuart Skinner has been great. He's been lights out. 29, 14, and 5, 9, 14 save percentage. Goals against, though, despite all those saves, he's still allowing 2.75 goals against per game. Poor guy. Jack Campbell, good record, tough numbers. I don't think he plays unless there's a major issue with Stuart Skinner. So Skinner, I think I foresee him being good, but the Avalanche are just too strong offensively. Yes, the Oilers are stronger offensively, but I think that the Avalanche offense versus the Oilers defense, despite how well it's done, will overpower the Oilers offense versus the Avalanche defense. Despite the goaltending, I would say going to the Oilers and even maybe the forwards slightly to the Oilers, I think the defense is strong enough and the forwards are close enough that the Avalanche will take it. But I see it being a much closer series. You would think this is the year that the Oilers finally get it done, but I think unfortunately it will be heartbreak once again and the Avalanche in seven will go through to the Stanley Cup final. Now, over in the Eastern Conference, Bruins versus Devils. Now, part of what comes into these matchups is not just what's on paper, it's also where they've been. I have the Bruins going through the Panthers and the Leafs in you know five or six games in each series. Meanwhile, the Devils would have taken, or the Rangers would have taken down the other team in seven, the Hurricanes likely in seven, and now they're tired against one of the best teams, if not the best team in NHL history. So the Bruins score more, allow way less, pretty much even power play, better penalty kill. I think that the Bruins goaltending and their offense will overpower the Devils or even the Rangers at this point. And the Bruins will, you know, that's a quick analysis, but I think it's fair enough just to say that the Bruins would beat the Devils at that point if that scenario, if those scenarios had come to fruition. So, ooh, big surprise. The winner of the West is facing the winner of the East. You know, I'm not like I'm shocking anybody here, but I do think that this is the, the matchup that makes the most sense with all the information that we've had. The Bruins and the Avalanche are the two best teams record-wise this season in terms of their conferences. They're the two best teams in the entire league record-wise since the halfway point. They're the two best teams in the entire league since the deadline record-wise as well. I gotta say, I think that it's going to be one of these matchups. It's very rare where the top two teams make it all the way there. There's always an upset somewhere in there. And yes, we've already seen some upsets, but I think the Avalanche will face the Bruins in the 2023 Stanley Cup Final, where the Bruins have the better offense and the better defense. The Avalanche have the better power play. The Bruins have the better penalty killing. Now, Again, it's probably no surprise for what I'm about to say. The Bruins are just so strong. They are deep. They had great deadline pickups. They have incredible goaltending. They're going to be more rested after I think their hardest challenge will come against the Devils, but I still think there will be six games probably. The Avalanche made it through Seattle in five, yes, but a tight six, seven game series against Dallas, seven game series against Edmonton. Fatigue does play into it, especially for a team that won the Stanley Cup last year. They have played a lot of hockey in the last 365 days. So I do think that the Bruins will win the 2023 Stanley Cup. Hurts a little bit as a Canadiens fan, of course, but I got to speak objectively. And it would be an incredible story for so many guys. Bergeron, Krejci, Linus Allmark, who finds his way over to Boston and probably wins the Vezina as well. David Pasternak in his 61 goals. So I do have the Bruins winning it. Not a huge surprise here, but that is my, those are my thoughts at this time. As always, anything can happen, but here is my bracket. So finally, the tiebreaker, final, the number of goals scored in the series uh i guess i could show you all maybe you maybe you'll copy me and you'll change something and you'll try to beat me out in the bracket challenge let's break out the calculator here if the avalanche score an average of 3.83 goals for per game you can hear it as well and the bruins score an average of 3.33 that's 3.17 uh, 3 7.16 goals per game let's say it's a good seven game series that's 50.12 goals so we may as well just go ahead and round it to a 50 goal series there we go so i'll go ahead and submit that in just a moment now for the details on the data 72 bracket challenge what we'll be doing is the winner of the bracket challenge will have a created player in a future franchise mode series it may have to wait until nhl 24 maybe it's a live stream maybe it's an mlb the show franchise player named after you something like that but you will have a name of a player even your own name in some franchise mode series similar to how the winners of our yahoo fantasy hockey league will have players in the upcoming series that will probably start a couple weeks from now as we wrap up the sharks series on nhl 23 so if you would like to join the challenge 
challenge come see us over on the discord server i think we're, we're about 400 people over there it's not just talking about the channel it's talking about your franchise modes it's talking about the world of hockey we're watching games live together it's a real blast over there the community is so great we're closing on 6,000 subscribers it's unbelievable stuff and we it would be that much better with you as a part of it so join the discord server not just for that but for the link which will be in the announcements tab on the discord server that will be where you find the link to join the challenge and then we can you know banter and slander each other in the uh in the channels afterwards once we have all of our uh, brackets created so that's it for me, ladies and gentlemen, on my predictions and analysis for the 2023 postseason. This one was re uh, recorded myself in the future after each round or after each series. I'll see what we can find time for. We will be having live streams to break it all down and discuss it here on YouTube. So be sure that you are subscribed to not miss out on that, as well as everything else that we do here on the channel. As I mentioned, lots of franchise mode content and real world hockey analysis. So if you enjoyed this, take a look around the channel and I'm sure you enjoy much of everything else. Leave a like if you enjoyed the breakdowns. And as I said, leave all your thoughts agree with me disagree with me what do you think your biggest upsets are i want to see all that down in the comments it's fun to always come back and read it so i'll thank you once again for taking the time to enjoy this video and i'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next one and have a happy 2023 postseason